So we are, you're having an essentials class today. And we were last week uh, beginning this class on salvation, the golden chain of Romans 8.30. Um, last week we uh, only covered election. And today we are only going to cover effectual calling. We're going to end up making three or four lessons out of this one, I think. Um, does everyone have one of the handouts that uh, Brenda was passing out? Oh, okay. So we're going to focus most of our attention on the, the 1689 and what it says about effectual calling. Um, but we'll be referring to some other books. This one, uh, John Murray's Redemption Accomplished and Applied. If you don't have it, it's something you ought to have and read. We're going to look at a Burkhoff Systematic Theology, and we may refer a little bit to this Sam Waldron exposition of the 1689 all good resources for you. But let's just start with the definition of effectual calling. That call that ushers men into a state of salvation and is therefore effectual. That is from this book, um, John Murray's Redemption Accomplished and Applied. Uh, turn with me to, if, well, if you've got your 1689, um, and by the way, there's an app that you can you can always have your 1689 with you. Um, preparing for this helped me to have a better grasp on uh, the 1689 itself and to understand the order of the things that are in here. But the effectual call is is dealt with um, in chapter 3, paragraph 6. It's one place. We'll look there first. Um, I'll read that to you. So the, 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 the title of the chapter is God's Decree, and, and paragraph 6 says, As God has appointed the elect unto glory, so by the eternal and completely free intention of his will, he has foreordained all the means of bringing their salvation about. Accordingly, those who are elected, being fallen in Adam, are redeemed in Christ, are effectually called to faith in Christ by his spirit working in due season, are justified, adopted, sanctified, are kept by the power by his power through faith unto salvation, neither are any but the elect redeemed in Christ, effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved. So he deals so, so we're going to come back to that, but that's that's chapter three, paragraph six, and then um, uh, chapter ten is effectual calling. And if, even if you, if you just look at the table of contents in the 1689, chapters 10 through 17 or 18, depending on how you count it, are, are, are all, each chapter covers one of the steps in what we call the order of salvation. So 10 is effectual calling, then justification, adoption, sanctification, saving faith, repentance and salvation, good works, the perseverance of the saints, and then 18 is assurance of salvation. And it's interesting that there's not a chapter titled Regeneration. But that's part of, part of the reason for that is the Reformers in the 17th century, 
wrapped effectual calling and regeneration sort of un, into the same concept. And, and we'll see part of that as we go through what's covered in 1689. The, so as we talk about these things in the order of salvation and all of those logical pieces of it, it's not as if they happen uh, sequentially. Um, the, the, there is a logical order to them, but um, I found a, a brief article on uh, Ligonier's website that I thought described the process together. Um, he says, I don't have the writer, which, which writer this is. Uh, but he says, there is no time sequence in this, as if we could be called for a while before we are regenerated and then live regenerated without having repented, and then we could repent but not turn to Christ and then finally come to justifying faith. No, they are all logical steps in the same event. When God calls us, we are immediately regenerated and we turn from sin to God in one action which justifies us. And those who are justified are immediately glorified in the sense of being adopted as children of God. So don't get caught up in, in some sort of time lapse uh, when we're talking about these different logical steps in the order. All right, but the, So let's look at 10. Uh, uh, chapter 10, Effectual Calling. I'm going to just read through it, and then we're going to come back and, and try to break down these things in, in more detail. Um, and this lesson is really built around um, Romans 8.30. So, and those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. So there's not... Is, it, that doesn't cover like every single step in the in the order of salvation, but it 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 does sort of frame the sort of the logical progression of things, and we'll see that you know just certain things have to happen in certain order. Um, but effectual calling, uh, chapter ten, section one: those whom he has predestined to life, he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time to effectually call by his word and spirit, out of that state of sin and death which they are in by nature, to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ. He enlightens their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God. He takes away their heart of stone and gives them a heart of flesh. He renews their wills and by his almighty power causes them to desire and pursue that which is good. He effectually draws them to Jesus Christ, yet in such a way that they come absolutely freely, being made willing by his grace. And I'm going to read two, and, and we'll, we'll break down one and two before we get to three. Uh, we'll come back to three, and if I guess if we have time. Um, two, this effectual call is of God's free and special grace alone not on account of anything at all foreseen in man, it is not made because of any power or agency in the creature who is wholly passive in the matter. Man is dead in sins and trespasses until quickened, made alive, and renewed by the Holy Spirit. By this he is enabled to answer the call to embrace the grace offered and conveyed by it. This enabling power is no less power than that which raised up Christ from the dead. So as, as I was thinking about this lesson and, and I wanted to really, I wanted to, t to take like the first 38 minutes of the 45 and just preach the gospel. <laughs> um, That's really what we're talking about. It's you, know, the, you, you can have um, no effectual call 
I mean, the, the Spirit of God works in the preaching of the gospel. Um, you know, Romans 1, is it 16 or 17, says, gospel is the power of God to salvation. Um, you know, as I was thinking about this, though, I mean, I heard the gospel like dozens and dozens of times before it was effective for me. And and so then I started thinking about well, when when was it effective? When did that actually happen to me? When did that internal working of the spirit um, just sort of grab me? And um, I was I was forty two. And it was, I believe, January 2nd of 2000. I had been in church for seven or eight years, I guess, at that point. Um, three different churches, um, you know, been, been in and around the church, Christians, um, but lost. And... Um, and I was sitting there that I was sitting, sitting at First Baptist uh, Orlando that Sunday morning, um, and just I, I don't remember what the preaching was about. I don't remember, um, but it probably wasn't very good. Um, it's probably some New Year's message, you know. Um, but the whole time, just just gripped by the reality of what a hypocrite and a sinner I was, um, and just wrestling with like, what, what, what am I doing here? What is going on? Why am I like this? You know, why do I live this way? What what is wrong with me? Um, and and so I that is when I can I I you know when I look back at my conversion. I don't know that um, I don't know that you know I can say that you know at that moment I was born again, but it was at that moment that I began to realize that I was not. And over the course of the next um, three months or so, C.S. Lewis talks about how he you know he walked over a bridge and on one side of it he was lost and on the other side he was saved. And he doesn't really understand why um, there wasn't anything in particular that happened, you know, as he was crossing the bridge that, you know, brought this new life. But I know that's where I started on, on that day in January 2nd. And I came out about three months later on the other end, understanding um, that I had been lost and that I was found. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, So, effectual call. Um, does anybody else want to? Can, can, I mean, is this something that you, you've thought about? Like, when was that? When, when did that? Um, when did the Spirit of God um, yes? Mm hmm. Smooth. <laughs> I think it, it's important to, to say, I, like, um, and I know you know this, that, you know, effectual calling and regeneration is an instantaneous act where God mm -hmm. imparts spiritual life to a dead sinner. Um, but when people kind of, kind of describe their conversion or them becoming a genuine Christian, sometimes that instantaneous act is imperceptible to them. Mm -hmm. You know, so I just think it's important to, to note that, that the way that C.S. Lewis explains his conversion could come off unbiblical in the sense that, well, nothing happened in between me on this side of the bridge being lost and me being on this side of the bridge 
um, and being saved. That if he if he indeed came to saving faith, then something did happen, instantaneous, right. effectual call and regeneration. But to to our understanding, sometimes it's imperceptible. Right, and so I ask the question only to you know ask you to think about it like um it's worth thinking about it's a you know this is god uh working in you and and um giving you a new light giving you making you a new creation out of you so you know, it's it's I, I I do I am going to sort of cross over between the effectual calling and regeneration, and we're going to see as I think we go through this lesson that, that there is a very close connection. What what has happened since the reformers, um, um, since the 1689 was written, is that these are more clearly distinct, uh, distinctly defined um, ideas. Um. And C.S. Lewis so much, but I, I think that that story he recounted, it's recounted in "Surprised by Joy" by C.S. Lewis, and the idea that nothing happened is nothing miraculous in the sense that, like, he didn't see an angel or hear a voice, or it was that God effectually called him, one, and, and it just happened during that walk. Mm-hmm. Like he's on one side of the bridge, an unconverted man, and nothing miraculous, like. Again, an angel, some manifestation, um, uncontrollable uh, weeping, right? It was he's considering these things, and as he's reflecting upon the gospel, he's an unconverted man, and then on the other side, he's he's converted. And I, I think that's the idea in Surprised by Joy, that what he's trying to communicate. Not that nothing happened, but that... Um, Nothing miraculous. Right. God didn't just show up and say, hey. He did, but, right? No no yeah. Saul of Tarsus, no audible <clears throat> voice, no, none of that. Yeah. Um, I remember Albert Martin kind of describing this this change when it comes to the perspective of the, the recipient of, of grace. And he said this, this effectual calling and regeneration for, for some – it's as bright as the noonday sun and like a lightning bolt. But for others, it's like the, the shifting of the day from, from dusk to dawn. Uh, excuse me, not dusk to dawn, but from, from dusk to day and from day to noon and from noon to, to dusk. So it's very uh, like a subtle shifting instead of like a um, Martin Luther lightning bolt strike struck um, God uh, uh, um, revealing himself in a um, very perceptible way to bring the person to Christ. So it was very helpful with me because, you know, with people growing up in the church, a lot of times it's like that. You know, you, you, you'll have, um, they, they've been in church all their life. They've heard the gospel um, time after time. And then um, all of a sudden, there there starts to take root in them um, evidences of, of of grace, and they start to manifest genuine repentance and saving faith. And it's hard to say, well, this this is the time. This was the exact time. Right. And with other people, um, it can be very very clear, especially when they live an external um, immoral life, and there's a an exterior. Um, radical change of of behavior. <clears throat> well, so so back to chapter ten and um, the first paragraph of uh, this section on effectual calling. Um, <clears throat> there's a there's a commentary that I found on online that is. Um, Gary Gamble, I think is his name, um, and it's a 1689. He's a uh, he's a part of a church in Arizona, uh, and his 
his exposition in some ways is really more helpful than Waldron's. Um, but so I've borrowed from some of the things that, that and I think it's 1689confession.com, I think is the name of it. Um, but the, so he says, the first act in the order of salvation is effectual calling, but it is rooted in election. And we talked about election last week. As such, the confession begins at predestination. So this first paragraph, first sentence, those whom God hath predestined unto life. Um, he is pleased um, and is appointed accepted time to effectually call. And, and that's the order of um, Romans 8.30. Uh, one of the the, the th if you go back, if, so looking at Romans, going back before 8.30, um, starting in, uh, well, in 8.29, um, for whom, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. You know, one of the things that, I think we 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 can overlook is that um, if you I mean if, so who is doing in eight twenty nine uh, predestined to be conformed he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son who did the the predestining God the Father. Um, so it was encouraging to me to to think about that. You know, when we think about our relationship with God, I mean, I'm primarily thinking about Christ. Um, and sometimes I think, well, I don't think enough about, my, you know, this is how the person of the Spirit of God is uh, is God, and and um, you know, I, I ought to have a greater consciousness of. Um, who he is. Um, but in thinking about God the Father's role in um, in this, it was just encouraging to know how much of a role he has and, you know, how intimately involved in our salvation God the Father is. Um, Gamble says, God... The Father effectually calls the elect. The Spirit and the Son are certainly involved in effectual calling, but it is the Father who initiates it. Murray gets at this in uh, his chapter on effectual calling. Um, he said, it is God that... So this is his chapter 11, um, page 89. It is God the Father who is the specific agent in the effectual call. This aspect of biblical teaching we are too liable to overlook. We think of the Father as the person of the Trinity who planned salvation and as the specific agent in election, and we think properly when we do so, but we fail to discern other emphases of Scripture, and we dishonor, and we do dishonor to the Father when we think of him simply as planning salvation and redemption. The Father is not far removed from the effectuation of that which he designed in his eternal counsel and accomplished in the death of his Son. He comes into the most intimate relation to his people in the application of redemption by being the specific and particular actor in the inception of such application. Pardon? Amen. Yeah. The evidence to support this is copious and conclusive when Paul says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. It is obvious that the author of predestination is the author of the call. Um, and in the preceding verse, the author of predestination is distinguished from the person who is called the Son, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Only of the Father can it be said 
that he predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son for the simple reason that only in respect of the father is the son the son. Um, so <laughs> that was, it's, in, it's uh, encouraging and amazing and um, just, I, you know, makes me feel closer to the father. You know, to know of his uh, specific intentional action in the sal- in my salvation. Um, so, think about that. The um, so going back to the this first paragraph. Um, The Father effectually calls by his word and spirit. Uh, you know, I have, I've spent less time in this uh, systematic theology, Burkhoff's, than I have in Grudem's. But uh, Burkhoff deals with the subject of effectual calling and regeneration, I think, much more thoroughly uh, uh, <laughs> than um, Grudem. So I encourage you to, you know, spend some time reading it. But Burkhoff says, um, the calling of God may be said to be one. So external and internal. So the call, the, the gospel call, in other words, may be said to be one. And the distinction between an, an external call and an internal call or effectual calling merely calls attention to the fact that this one calling has two aspects. Um, and then Gamble sort of explains this. The word is the gospel message, and without it, there is no salvation. So we're talking about this phrase, the Father effectually calls by his word and spirit. So, so what does that mean exactly? Well, it's by his word It's the preaching of the gospel. Um, The word is the gospel message, and without it, there is no salvation. This is so because, as as chapter 1 in the Confession established, general revelation is insufficient to explain God's will for our our salvation. Um, But it it is by the word and spirit. So the spirit is working in the word preached. Um, so in, in Burkhoff's um, systematic theology, the, the, this idea of uh, how does this happen? W- what is the actual, um, how is God working in the preaching of the gospel to, to cause someone to be born again. And um, it's worth thinking about. Um, and, and so he deals with, um, well, first of all, at the beginning of this chapter, he talks about this the idea that the reformers um, sort of wrap these things together, effectual call and regeneration. Um, but one of the things that the, 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 the systematic theology deals with and that is the subject of a lot of, you know, theologians' attention is, you know, what is the order? Uh, are, are you regenerated so that when you hear the call, you'll respond? Or are you regenerated when you hear the gospel? You know, what What is the... How does this work? What is what is? So we're talking about the order of salvation. What is the order? Uh, and it's interesting. There was I found an article by Derek Thomas in which um, he's written some of the I can't remember all of the books. But we've read some of them here, um, but he has a chart which shows like nine different ideas about what is the order of salvation. Uh, of course, now the Arminians have the order. Um, you know, regeneration always comes after 
the call because they're, you know, you know you're, you're calling God down to save you um, in, in their theology. But so this one section in Burkhoff's book, The Relative Order of Calling and Regeneration. Um, this is probably this is perhaps best understood if we note the following steps. One, logically, the external call and the preaching of the word, except in the case of children, generally precedes or coincides with the operation of the Holy Spirit, by which the new life is produced in the soul of man. Then the creative word, God. Then by a creative word, God generates the new life changing the inner disposition of the soul, illuminating the mind, rousing the feelings, and renewing the will. In this act of God, the ear is implanted that enables man to hear the call of God to, to the salvation of his soul. In it, man is entirely passive. Having received the spiritual ear, the call of God in the gospel is now heard by the sinner and is brought home effectively to the heart. The desire to resist has been changed to a desire to obey, and the sinner yields to the persuasive influence of the word through the operation of the Holy Spirit. This is the effectual calling through the instrumentality of the word of preaching effectively applied by the Spirit of God. The effectual calling finally secures through the truth as a means the first holy exercises of the new disposition that is born in the soul. The, the new life begins to manifest itself, manifest itself. The implanted life issues in the new birth. This is the completion of the work of regeneration in the broader sense of the word and the point at which it turns into conversion. And it's, it's a lot and, and, and <laughs> to read and, and to digest, but um, the the I do you have a question? From from what you just read, and um, if we were to take verse twenty nine and try to apply that practically, let's say on a Saturday morning. Um, before we walk out this door, if we're going to preach to John Doe, who's, you know, currently not converted, at the time, he is foreknown and predestined, right? Even though we haven't knocked on his door yet. So we knocked on his door, we preach the gospel uh, by the Spirit of God, the effectual call takes place, right? And the Holy Spirit convicts him, and then after that, is regenerated. Would you say that's the, like if you were to boil it down in a nutshell, that's how it would practically take place? Um, I wouldn't say after that. After. There is, there is, it, so we're, we are talking about an order, but these things are all simultaneous. So it is in the preaching that he is, the spirit works and he is regenerated. Um, There's not like this time lapse uh, necessarily. But as far as being um, like where it says, if he's going to be for you and also predestined, um, let's say that, you know taking that Saturday morning, and maybe it's it's wrong to kind of put it on sequence by days. But uh, prior to us knocking on his door, he he, he was, was predestined, predestined and foreknown. Was foreknown. Yeah, and then through the preaching. Like you said, maybe the effectual call and regen regeneration take place at the same time. That's what you're saying. Yeah, I think, yes, yeah, so the effectual call and regeneration are not separated in time, um, but they be, they've they become distinct concepts uh, over the last couple of hundred years. When the 1689 was written, they were more dealt with as the same. Um Yeah, uh, I think the the uh, what's Im what's important to understand about the uh, the order or the order of salvation is that one, it is 
clearly taught in the Bible that there is a particular order. I think Romans 8 highlights that truth. And the intention, and I think it's a, it's a biblical intention, and the purpose of outlining that order is to highlight the grace of God in salvation. So that in another scheme, right, um, for example, you have many texts that call men to repent and believe. Uh, in an Arminian scheme, man's response would be the cause of regeneration. The purpose of the Ordo is to highlight the grace of God in redemption. How it's God who, who causes men to be born again through the word preached. Um, I, I don't know if that, that's helpful, but I think it's necessary to understand that. Uh, the Ordo is not artificially imposed upon the Bible. Again, Romans 8 teaches it. And the purpose of making those distinctions is to make very apparent to the believer that it's God who gives life and enables uh, men to repent, believe, all those other things. So, looking again at chapter 10, this first paragraph, those whom God has predestined to life, he is pleased and is appointed and accepted time to effectually call by his word and spirit. What? What, what, is, he, what is the effectual call accomplishing? It's calling him out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature. Um, to grace and salvation in Jesus Christ. Um, if you look back at chapter 9 in the 1689, um, the section on free will, uh, chapter 9, section 3, this is, this is where man is before this effectual call happens. Man, by his fall into a state of sin, has completely lost all ability of will to perform any of the spiritual good which accomplish, which accompanies salvation. As a natural man, he is altogether averse to spiritual good and dead in sin. He is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself for conversion. So, the effectual call uh, must come with a a full uh, the full gospel must be preached. So you, you know the, maybe you guys can correct me if you think I'm wrong here. But if so, can there can there be an effectual call? If the preacher says God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, I mean, I would like to think that you know of those hundreds and thousands of people who who respond to that altar call at First Baptist, for example, over the course of, you know, centuries, um, that some would have come in genuine repentant faith to Christ when, 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 when the message was, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Um, Brian and then Pastor Rick. Um, so I would be being a Pentecostal, grown up Pentecostal rather, um, I would base that on was the gospel preached? If the gospel is a power unto salvation, was the gospel preached? Thus the effectual call works through the gospel, nothing else. Um, um, so in, in, in Galatians, Paul makes it clear that Galatians 6, 1, oh, 1, 6, Paul makes a reference to 
a different gospel, which is really not another. All right, so there, um, there is preaching that is not gospel preaching, right? And I think to say to people, um, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life is very deceptive. Right, particularly in the context of American prosperity preaching and self esteem ism, I guess we would say. So, I don't think that constitutes the preaching of the gospel at all in any sense. Now, that God may use a crooked stick to draw a straight line is God's prerogative, right? So, when we're thinking about uh, proclaiming the gospel or making the gospel known, Instead of looking for the least common denominator or, you know, what's, what's the smallest amount of truth that I could give to an unbeliever so that he might be converted, I think we've already started thinking improperly. But I think your point is correct that I, on our part, it's uh, so as pastors, it's our responsibility to preach the gospel with as much clarity and scope as we can and then as individual believers – uh, to uh, as believers to believe those things and as we are declaring those things to others to be as, as thorough and as biblical as we can in the presentation of the message. Right? Now if God chooses to use a donkey to bring men to faith, right? that's God's prerogative. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, and in the, in, I don't think we're going to get to this, but the, the section three about infants dying, I was I was actually stunned really when I first saw this. The, the 1689, the, the exposition that Waldron, um, when he deals with this chapter, he, he spends like the first two thirds of his of his exposition of this chapter on paragraph three. Because of the implications uh, th- that come from, you know, can someone be saved without hearing and understanding the gospel? Um, and 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 Waldron and uh, Gamble take completely different, like Waldron says that really this, there's no scriptural support for the, for this idea. Um, in fact, the, the language, I believe originally in uh, in the 1689 was elect infants dying in infancy. Uh, th- this version just says infants dying in infancy. It's a di- it's a different thing. Um, but th- th- so the commentator like Burkhoff and and Grudem and and you know most others when we're talking about external call and effectual call, it, it is through the word of the gospel. It is through the true gospel. The, so the, um, you know, Isaiah 53, 6, uh, we have all gone astray, and, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Um, you, you need to have the full counsel, the the the. You know, to have a discussion about what the effectual call is, you, if we're assuming that we're talking about the actual call, which is that call that says you are a sinner bound for hell, and uh, apart from uh, you know Christ's substitutionary sin-bearing atonement, um, there is no hope for you. Um, So going on in this in this um, paragraph one, he enlightens their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God. He takes away their heart of stone and gives them a heart of flesh. He renews their will by his almighty power and causes them to desire and pursue that which is good. He effectually draws them to Jesus Christ, yet in such a way that they come absolutely freely being made willing by his grace. Um, and, and that last section there, becoming absolutely freely, um, 
is is the uh, probably the most misunderstood part of well I don't know the most it's widely um, despised <laughs> um, that that you could be predestined and come willingly. Um, What was the guy's the book that we read last year? Um, what? Geisler, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it was a disputation of that book. Yeah, you practically needed to to understand the disputation. But, you know, even, even Geisler, you know, this guy who is widely re respected in other areas, uh, you know, of theology uh, mischaracterizes what this means. Um, we, we are not being converted against our will. <laughs> you know, our will is, is what's being changed. Um, they come in such a way that they come absolutely freely being made willing by His grace. Um, and then Section two, um, or paragraph two in this, um, this really addresses the, the Arminian error. Um, the effectual call is of God's free and special grace alone, not on account of anything at all foreseen in man. So these arguments, I mean, they go back a long way. Um, it is not made because of any power or agency in the creature who is wholly passive in the matter. Man is dead in sins and trespasses until quickened and renewed by the Holy Spirit. By this he is enabled to answer the call and to embrace the grace offered and conveyed by it. This enabling power is no less power than that which raised up Christ from the dead. Pretty... Um, astounding so not on account of anything at all foreseen it's not that God saw down the corridor of time and knew who would respond but that is the core belief of a lot of professing Christians um, especially it seems the, the prosperity gospel but um, and that's the theology of some of the people uh, that I've interacted with who are, um, you know, by, by um, the world standards, uh, you know, radical Christians. <laughs> and, you know, when I first began to think about uh, Reformed theology and... Um, when I got to this church, I had no idea what it even was. Um, but when I began to understand it and and embrace it, then I thought, well, how, how can these people who think this even be saved? Um, can they? Yes, we don't have any Armenians in here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, Brian. So the question is, is can somebody who is not a Calvinist be saved? Is that what you're asking? <laughs> so I would say that if the person is trusting in the finished work of Christ, if that person is turning to Jesus Christ in faith from their sin and um, understanding that there's nothing good in them, um, yeah, they're saved. Like, you don't have to be a Calvinist to be saved. There's a lot of people who might have theology that is wrong. Um, and I believe that the true Christian, um, you know, if you approach a Christian from the Word of God, I believe the Spirit will lead them into truth. Um, I don't know, I don't know that, that necessarily there's a time frame associated with that. But to say that somebody is not saved because they have a misunderstanding of predestination or election, I think is I think is wrong. I believe I'm convinced from Scripture 
that I think Romans 9 makes it. I think it's all throughout the Bible, to be honest with you. Um, I, I'm convinced from Scripture that if it wasn't for Christ changing my will, I would have never chosen Christ. Um, and most people, you know, like my father, I always think of, like, uh, he, I would probably characterize him as a quasi-Arminian, right? But even him admits that if it wasn't for Jesus, if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, um, you know, drawing him and changing him, then, you know, he, he would be lost. He just, uh, it, I think a lot of people, it's more of a tradition kind of thing that they're just indoctrinated in throughout their entire life. And they can't, you know, rectify those things. But, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I agree. I, if, if at the end what you're doing is you're trusting in Christ alone, um, if you arrive at that same place um, in genuine belief, then um, you just need to be discipled. <laughs> um but I did. I, I I struggled with it at first. It's like, well, how, you know, how, uh, but there is a sense in which we are. We're, and I've heard this said. We're we're all Arminians right at the beginning, right? You know, what we see is that we need to repent and believe the gospel, and it's up to us, you know, to do that in order to be saved. Um, but when we understand. Um, how that actually worked itself out, I think we are more um, have a greater understanding of God's glory and salvation and or or um, able to well to to worship him and praise him um, more holy. Uh, and and to then not be led off into other errors. Uh, I know I know a lot of people who believe that they can lose their salvation, and it's because they start from the point that, you know, it's up to me to hold on to it. I'm so glad it's not up to me. Um, so let's. Uh, I think we're. I've gotten the red flag back there. Um, let's pray. Father in heaven, we are um, grateful for um, how you have uh, called us and saved us and been so merciful and kind to us and uh, changed us and caused us to love you and worship you and praise you. And um, it is our, our greatest privilege. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.